the reading from First Corinthians is about uh, the relationship between men and women. Paul is mostly talking about the um, cultural significance in his day of hair length and head coverings. Notice a couple things about it. Whoops. <laughs> Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, that is, from Adam's rib, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. There is a mutual dependence, even though he puts the husband in order of authority over the wife, and he puts uh, Christ over the husband, but Christ in subjection to God the Father. For Christ, when he was a man on earth, obeyed the Father, as the husband should obey Christ, and the wife should obey the husband. Now, of course, we don't talk so much about wives obeying husbands, and if you get married, you'll find out that that really doesn't happen. There really is a mutual thing going on. And if you have a good wife, she will constantly remind the husband not to be too full of himself. She will constantly remind him of when he's wrong. And even if he is the head of the household, technically speaking, there has to be a mutual agreement and understanding between the two. And Paul as much says that when he says, the woman is not independent of the man, nor the man of a woman. And he talks so much here about head coverings and hair. But don't major in minors. Don't get all worked up over this, because these ultimately are cultural issues. They're not central to the faith. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. In other words, this isn't something to be contentious about. But let's take a look, more importantly, I think, at what's going on in Genesis. Joseph comes out and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams and he saves Egypt and the entire Middle East from this famine. Now, this is something you might know. And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said unto all the Egyptians, Go unto Joseph, what he saith to you, do. Go to Joseph. Sometimes you will have priests tell you that, especially older priests, priests who are from the older days. I'm a little blurry. You notice that? Maybe I can fix that. Anyway, go to Joseph. People will say that if you go and ask for the intercession of St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. St. Joseph, you remember, also has dreams. It's the dreams of St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus, that tell him to take Mary into his household and not to put her away, that tell him that the Holy Family needs to flee to Egypt, that tell him that it's safe to come back when it is safe to come back. St. Joseph of the Holy Family is in many ways prefigured by Joseph the patriarch son of Israel. Go to Joseph, and whatever he tells you to do, do. And what does Mary say at the uh, wedding feast of Cana? When she asks Jesus to do the miracle and change the water into wine, and he says, woman, my hour is not yet come, but then she turns to the workers and she says, do whatever he tells you. Whatever he says to you, do it. Joseph in the Genesis story has this kind of wisdom. And notice again, when he's brought out of prison to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh, Pharaoh says, I've heard that you're great. My magicians can't do this, but you can. He doesn't say, oh yeah, I'm great. I can interpret anything. He says, it's not me, it's God. Joseph is in tune with God. His insight and interpretation into the mysteries of dreams is something more than human. And he's humble about that and admits that. And through that, we see him become a wise administrator. He becomes the chief administrator, as he was in Potiphar's household, so he becomes in all of Egypt, as he was even in prison, in a sense, with 
the guard sort of relying on him to run things. He becomes that way as well in Egypt. Now that's a wisdom that our bishops are sadly lacking, but that ability to understand what God wants and that ability to be wise in administration is part of the burden, not only that bishops have, but that any father has, and mother too, for that matter. Anyone running a business, anyone running a household, anyone teaching a class, anyone in a position of authority needs that sort of wisdom to be a good administrator. Now, you know, most people you go to, for instance, you know, let's just say, you know, Bishop Smith, who's goofy, like so many of them are, your parish priest probably shouldn't say to you, should not say to you, go to Smith. You can't go to somebody, you cannot teach what you do not have, you cannot pass on what you do not have, and you are not in a position. You cannot have the blind leading the blind. You cannot have confused shepherds shepherding a, con she shepherding a confused flock, which is typically what we have in the church today, sorry to say. The wisdom of Joseph, like the wisdom of a true head of a household, whether it's a father or a mother, that sort of wisdom is tied into God himself. That sort of wisdom is a humility, recognizing that it's not all about us, but that we have to prepare, as Egypt prepared for the coming famine, that kind of ability to figure out what to do in the world and be in charge of people, whether it's your children or your students or the people of Egypt in this case, or your flock if you're a shepherd, that kind of ability to know what to do requires the humility of a Joseph or a Saint Joseph from the Holy Family or any true Christian who must admit we are dependent on all of this for God. 